I am my childhood hero. If this sentence does not sound funny, can be humorous, entertaining, but not really serious nor sophisticated. It is just because we adults, we prefer to be mature, serious, and sophisticated if it's possible. For that reason, anything related with childhood reminds us immaturity, innocence, imagination, daydreaming, even idle hope. Those sentiments and values usually make an adult fragile, therefore have been sacrificed long ago in the name of adulthood. For that reason, anything related with childhood and childhood heroes, it's so difficult to make adults to listen or read. It's obvious that adults have nothing to do with childhood and childhood heroes, those flying stuffs and fairy ghosts and magical heroes like the one who was bound to a huge rock and each day an eagle was sent to feed on his liver only to grow back again to be uh, for this um, eagle and uh, for the next day. And there is another guy you will remember that he was punished for his chronicle betrayals um, to roll a huge rock up to a hill every morning and then just watch the, the rock was falling down and repeat this action forever. But as I see that you are smiling, we adults, we don't need such magical stories or mythological heroes uh, in order to remember the value of labor in the Sisyphus case or the act which, was, uh, which enabled the progress and civilization like Prometheus' case. Therefore, French author Antoine de Saint-Exupéry managed a huge thing which no other writer have ever managed in the literature history. Exupéry made the impossible is possible when he made adults to read childhood in The Little Prince and we keep reading The Little Prince since 1943. By the inspiration of The Little Prince, one may try or influence to reconstruct the meaning of adulthood. And um, I think that is a thin line in between childhood and adulthood, and I may say it's the awareness of self. Self, myself, I am, we are. When the TED um, conference in Istanbul announced that its team was I am, I immediately told all the uh, contributors, the, the speakers will be chosen among the fiction writers. It's not because I am exaggerating, but uh, I've, I've grown up among poets and fiction writers. And in the last 20 years, I, I'm earning my life by writing, so I had chances to meet different writers and poets, some of them really uh, great writers, from uh, Iceland to New Zealand, from Japan to South Africa. And I assure you, when we get together, the, main, uh, the most repeated two words are not really literary canons that we are influenced by or um, the great writers we really like. <laughs> I can tell you, directly that, uh, honestly, that the most two words repeated are I am. Then I saw the list of the speakers and I realized I was the only fiction writer. And as you can imagine that there was a deep depression and loneliness I had. So I'm not going to talk about a dry ego and or the superficial complaints of a narcissist. Instead, I will suggest you that our childhood heroes, if we invite our childhood heroes to, into our adulthood, into our adult lives from time to time in order to cure our ego wounds, ego scars of our arrogant souls. It's because our childhood heroes still have the healing power of inspiration and imagination. My childhood heroes were mostly male, but I did not know them then. Just because the gender is not discovered by children. And how would I know that even heroes had the gender? Even I was not aware of my own. I was just a child, only a human child. And that's why the world was a better place. 
Not only then, even today, Harry Potter is a great hero for the kids, but not Harriet Potter. Those heroes I adored had something in common which fascinating the most was called the adventure. They were traveling by planes, by trains, uh, by planes and the sky rockets and space rockets. They were flying, diving under the sea, and they were so free whatever they were doing. And uh, in the books, in the films, in the cartoons and graphic novels, which I still like to read, uh, they were having this freedom of adventure. I was not very sure what I, what I was understanding from adventure, but now when I go back those days, I understand that the adventure world, uh, and still is, antidotes for the boredom. And that's how I decided to be an astronaut and a submarine captain when I grow up. These were quite unusual professions for a young girl, not only was born in 60s in Turkey, but all over the cultures in the world that time. And maybe not for shamans, but their travel in the sky and under the sea uh, are very spiritual. And let me remind you what were the um, most popular professions for women in the 60s, and uh, well, it is not very much change in most of the world. It was being housewife, and if you really insist, you could be a nice doctor, a nice medical doctor, nice teacher, nice pharmacist, nice secretary, etc. But not an astronaut and submarine, submarine captain, for sure. When I go back to those years and uh, when I see that how I was, I was free as a young girl to imagine these uh, professions were not very usual in those days, I realized that I was not really, I was lucky not living in a misogynic surroundings. At that, this point, I want to express my gratitude to a French um, philosopher and writer, Simone de Beauvoir. And, uh, his, uh, her famous book called The Second Sex, and her famous saying, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Anyway, so um, as I mentioned before, I was lucky enough to have space for imagination in my own family, mostly because my mother was an educated woman, and she was, and she's still, a literature fan and cinema lover, movie lover. And, um, a father who was in love with his daughter. Therefore, when my mother was reading to me, when I was about six years old, uh, Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables, in Turkish translation, uh, she never put boundaries in the human feelings, no ethnic, no religious borders. Therefore, I always thought Cosette, one of the main heroines of Les Miserables, she was a poor girl living in the back street in Istanbul or Ankara and uh, in, in a neighboring uh, region. So it's because um, my mother never put those boundaries. So Cosette, the main heroine of Les Miserables, she was not a French Christian girl living in the other culture. She was one of us. And um, I believe uh, Victor Hugo as being a great, great writer, but also humanitarian, he would love to hear this. With the very same humanitarian reason, Peter Pan was a flying young girl for me, whom I adore watching the play again and again the whole theater season every weekend with my parents at the age of seven. That's how I became ill while opening my bedroom window that winter waiting for Peter Pan. Then there was time for <laughs> waiting for Godot. So when I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up, darling? I will be either an astronaut or I will be a uh, submarine captain, maybe both. Adults, we always laugh and we always find such, uh, find immature and, and funny those imaginations of the, ch of the children. But I was very keen of it and I remember how I met my mother mad in one summer, just rejecting the real food, but only having the vitamin pills in my, in my plate, and I was preparing myself for my astronaut career. 
However, instead of flying in rockets and diving in the submarines, I studied molecular biology and environmental sciences for years. Maybe because I have always found science is an adventurous journey and related with imagination. On the other hand, mathematics, philosophy, and literature are strongly related. By the help of scholarships, stipends, and summer jobs, I was able to study at the different universities in different continents, and I was able to travel the world with my backpacks all alone, myself, by trains, airplanes, ships, and while writing uh, travelogues, short stories in my 20s. Being a graduate student in different prestigious universities in different continents made my family and the society proud of my free spirit as long as I was a good student and a nice girl in abroad. After several years of writing and publishing some books, I was finally able to earn my life by writing. And you know, in one of those days, which I was counted uh, the promising young woman writer. I received a phone call from a leading paper asking one of my childhood fantasies to realize it for a series of interviews. I remember that moment very well because I heard the child who wanted to be a submarine captain, she appeared next to me and then suddenly she said, yes, 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 that's it. So I asked a journalist from that leading paper that I simply want to die with a submarine. Since we don't, and we still don't have a rocket to, tr rocket to travel in. The journalist calling from the leading paper did not answer me. So maybe he was speechless and there was a long silence in between us. And then he asked me if I had any other fantasies, meaning more conventional maybe. No, I didn't have. So I forgot them, and they forgot me, obviously. But after two or three weeks, he called me again, and he happily announced that they have organized a visit in a Navy base, and I would be able to visit a submarine on the sea, but not under the sea. I rejected all attempts of taming my fantasies, because I was really... Um, uh, willing to visit, uh, diving with a submarine, and I don't want to, uh, visiting submarine as a museum. After two more weeks or so, they were able to organize the real thing, and one crisp September morning, I left my baby son to a babysitter, and I hold my childhood's hand, and we went there to the um, Tuzla Navy base by Marmara Sea, it must be quite, quite close here now. And with three journalists, those journalists were uh, assigned for the taking photos and for other technical stuff. And there I saw the submarine Dolunai, meaning full moon. And its crew were lined up in front of the submarine. And it was a, a naval tradition. Whoever was visiting the submarine, they had to line up and greet the visitor. When I was shaking, they introduced me to the captain, and when I was shaking the hand of captain, I found a chance and I whispered into his ears that I am so happy, deeply honored to meet with Captain Nemo, finally. <laughs> I still remember his face, the captain. He looked at me, and he, he looked like he, he just touched a, um, a cold jellyfish in the night in a desert. But I was not expecting anything that, uh, you know, he would understand because I was there together with my childhood. And we spent about three hours in the uh, submarine. We dived 50 meters and uh, I, was, I interviewed with the crew about their problems and it's really claustrophobic to live in, to work in such uh, environment and it's really difficult what they are doing. <laughs> they even let me to play with Periscope. Then the, there was a the time to go and uh, to leave and we were on the sea and again the whole um, crew lined up to say goodbye. It was just a naval tradition. 
So when the time came and I said goodbye to the captain, this time he pulled me himself and he whispered into my ears. He said, Captain Nemo will never forget you. Captain Nemo will always remember you, Miss Phuket. That, <laughs> I remember that moment very well, that I suddenly saw a young boy next to the captain and he looked like very much to him and it was his childhood and I finally managed or somehow managed to take his childhood back. And then I turned and I saw my childhood, these two ch children were so happy to meet. And I look at into the captain's eyes and he see, he saw that I saw our childhood together. I have never seen the captain again, but that day I received a certificate and I also had the honor of being the first civilian woman who ever dived in a submarine. And <clears throat> in that, uh, certificate, it says, we announce to all friends of Seven Seas that Miss Bouquet became the Seven Seas friend and she will be always friend of Seven Seas. I want to conclude by the little prince's words. He says, all grown-ups were children once, but only few of them remember it. Thank you. <laughs>